just hold it in. I just can't stop. Amen. Praising the name of Jesus. I don't know about y'all. I hate it when people say that. I don't know about y'all. But I don't know about y'all. But I can't stop praising the name of Jesus because he's been so good to me. To my family. He's a mighty good God. He's a God for today. He was a God for my yesterdays. And he will be, if I live, my God for tomorrow. He's all that and that bag of chips. Better than Ruffles. And I like Ruffles. He's better than that. He's a protector. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. He's a God of peace. I call on him for peace a lot of times. We live in a very stressed, stressing world, don't we? Oh, yes, we do. We do. We do. And we come to church and we put on our, our little self-righteous behavior because we, we feel that this is the garment that we have to wear when we come to church. But you know what? When we leave here, we go back into that mess that we left when we should take Jesus into that situation. In fact, we should see Jesus ahead of the situation that we're going into. Sometimes all you have is to say the name of Jesus. He'll keep you from an accident if you say, Jesus, I've done it. Jesus on the road. Jesus in the air. Jesus wherever you are. How many times has God kept you out of danger? Some of you can't count the times. There are too many to mention. Because you put yourself in harm's way. But Jesus brought you out. So I can't stop praising his name. So if you would bow with me in a moment of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your name, Jesus. Because you are the God who saves. You are the God that, God, God that is ever near to us. And you want to draw us nigh to you. We thank you, God, that it is a personal relationship that you want from us. It is not a distant relationship, but one that is right here in the here and now. We thank you, Lord, that you are the, the God of Ephesians 3.20. You will do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. And that power is the Holy Spirit. So thank you, God, for residing in us and all of those who believe in your name and who call your name Jesus. Not just when, when we, we are in trouble, but when during the good times as well. Jesus, you're a good time God. Jesus, you're a God for all occasions. Jesus, you're a God in that midnight hour. Jesus, everywhere we go. So we give you praise, glory, and honor on this day that the Lord has made. And now as I get ready to speak the words that I believe that you gave to me to give to your people, I ask that you step forward right now, Lord. And that I step back. And that your word will come forth with power and authority. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. And every heart said amen. Amen and amen. We're going to talk about being anointed and appointed today. Anointed and appointed. And our scripture reference, as you can see, comes from the, the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. It is the appointment of Joshua to the leadership of the children of Israel after the death of Moses. And I would like for all of you, because we have the same scripture, all of those of you who can, to stand with me and read, let us read this scripture reference together. Let us stand. And I want us to read it slowly with clarity and with the dignity that is deserving of the word of God. Can the church say amen to that? Amen, amen. amen. If you have it, let us, young people, do you not have, you don't have the scripture?
you guys are going to share, okay? So we will read together, starting with verse 1. Let us read. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. You and all these people get ready to cross the river into the land I am about to give to the I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river the Euphrates all of the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Say that last phrase again because it's applicable to all of us. I will never leave you. Now say it like you mean it. I will never leave you. Nor forsake you. Let's continue. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful. All the law my servant Moses gave you, do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. And the word of the Lord is blessed. You may be seated. And this is an interesting story. And I encourage all of you when you get home to read the book of Joshua and study the history of the Israelites as they went from slaves to free people in the promised land. It took them 40 years to get to the point where God would allow them to enter the promised land. Joshua's name means, now every name should have a meaning, would you not agree? Every name should have a meaning. Joshua's name means Yahweh saves or God saves. The name Moses means to draw forth. And it's indicative of how he became a prince of Egypt. So let me digress for a minute and talk about Moses. We're going to spend most of our time talking about Joshua today. But you need a little bit of history about Moses, the predecessor, the leader of the Jews, the predecessor of Joshua, uh, because it's important because Joshua studied under Moses. Amen? Amen? Yes, he did. As some of you know, Moses was saved from death as an infant because God had a plan and a purpose for his life. Some of you think you're here by accident, but God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of you right here, right now. Some of you have been saved from danger, seen and unseen, because God has a purpose for your life. You're not here by accident. You're not here by accident. God has a plan for you. Uh, the Israelites were living in slavery in the land of Egypt. And the Pharaoh, seeing how the Jews were multiplying in his land and, 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 and being afraid that they might one day rise up against Egypt, set up a plan to destroy the babies, the boys, who were coming into the world as infants. 
So they was going to kill children before their promise even occurred or materialized. But God had God knew this and he thwarted the plan of the Pharaoh. God miraculously intervened in the life of Moses and he ended up being raised in the palace, in the palace of the very man who wanted to kill him. Isn't that something? How many of you know that death can be a weapon formed, but it cannot prosper if God is on your side? It's a weapon formed. As a baby, Moses was put in a basket, and he was placed in the Nile River, and he was found and drawn forth, thus the name Moses, from the waters of the Nile by the daughter of the Pharaoh, and raised a prince of Egypt. Moses couldn't be killed by Pharaoh's swords, nor could he be killed by the Nile River because God, again, had a plan and a purpose for his life. So he was found in that little reed basket by Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh ended up being a pawn in the plan of God. How many of you know that God will make a pawn in the plan of God, of your, a pawn of your enemies in the plan of God? He will set them up for failure. Because they want to stop you and your purpose. Like Mo Moses, some of you should be there. We talked about that just a minute ago. But God drew you out and brought you forth. And you're alive today, not because of anything you did, not because you're so special or so pretty, but because God, I'm going to keep saying it, has a plan and a purpose for your life. You're not here by accident. As we look at this particular passage of scripture that we just read, we see that the baton of leadership is being officially passed from Moses to Joshua by the only person or being who could make that appointment. It was being made by God himself. Some of us want to rush our appointment. But God knows the appointed time. It didn't matter to God that Joshua's background was different from that of Moses. God already knew that, didn't he? He knew that instead of a palace, Joshua was raised in the slums as a slave in Egypt. God that knew that, that Joshua, Joshua was not educated in the royal palace and universities like Moses was. God already knew that. And it didn't matter to him. What he what mattered to God was Joshua's character, his integrity, and his heart. You don't have to be the most educated, the prettiest, or whatever. God knows who you are, and in due time he'll bring you out. God knew that Joshua had a heart for the people and that he had an eight God-given leadership ability. All Joshua had to do was follow and learn from the chosen leader, Moses. And he did that for how many years, Bible students? Huh? Forty. Forty. Smart guy. I'm loving this. Yeah. Joshua was Moses' assistant. And interestingly enough, the Hebrew word for assistant usually refers to service in worship. But it can also mean service to an individual. And in Deuteron Deuteronomy 34, now I say Deuteronomy five times, like there you go, but anyway. <laughs> Deuteronomy 34, 9. Uh, it reads, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Moses, the given leader, had laid his hands on him as validation. So the children of Israel heeded Joshua and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Joshua was anointed to leadership by God long before his appointment 
to leadership took place. In the natural, we know that God has a work for us to do, and some of us want to jump, jump the gun and step out before our time, but I'm not talking about, you know, just church here. I'm talking about life in general. Many times when we're young, we think our parents don't know anything. Nobody's saying anything. But it's true. We think our parents who have God-given rulership over our lives are full of it, whatever it is. We think they're dumb and, and don't know what's going on in the real world. But parents are there to provide the wisdom based on life experiences to help you become strong and healthy and mature adults. Pastor Jim and I are your spiritual parents here at Greater Faith Ministries, and we want you to be the best that you can be in all ways. We not only want you to know the Bible and understand the Bible, but we want you to be prepared to excel, not just hibernate through life. We want you to be the best that you can be. That's one of the reasons why we focus on education here. And, and let me digress just a little bit, if you don't mind. Did any ones of you watch the Republican National Convention or a little bit of it, snippets of it? I didn't. I couldn't watch the whole thing, but you, I watched snippets of it. Some of you watched snippets of it. Um, but but it was an interesting um, process. I thought. Um, there was an incident involving an African-American female reporter, did you hear about this, who was insulted by one of the delegates and called a monkey or something like that. This is how we treat, you heard about that, this is how we treat monkeys. I didn't see it or read it, but I was told about this. That, can you believe that's happening in 2012? And, and I'm not being political, but I'm, I'm wanting you to watch and be aware of the systems that are being put in place even now, today, that will affect your future and the future of all of our children and the future of, grand, of our, our grandchildren. These are serious times in which we live. And, and some of us, I've heard some Christians say that it's not our job to vote. Has anybody heard that? from certain, certain pious ones. As a Christian, I don't vote. The Bible tells us to be in the world and not of the world. And, and that means that we have to use the systems that are already in place, in my opinion, like voting, to change the world for the better, as much as we can. Um, again, I'm digressing to tell you about a couple of meetings that uh, I attended this week that might have long-range effects on all of us here. One was a meeting of pastors from various de denominations across the city, and that meeting was to discuss hunger and poverty in America. Hunger and poverty in America. Uh, there are things in place right now to keep programs like SNAP and other programs that help uh, poor and hungry people in this country um, to take away those resources from them. Um, and on the professional side, I, I represented the National Association of Women Business Owners at a meeting of what is it called? The Small Business Health Care Consortium that on Tuesday, and, and we were talking about how small business need to be, in, how small businesses need to be involved proactively in, in looking at and responding to those uh, members of Congress who want to do with the Affordable Health Care Act. There are ramifications to all of us here if that act is taken away, or as Mitt Romney says, he's going to do away with it on his first full day in office by executive decree or however he intends to do it. He's going to do away with it. And again, I'm not making a political announcement here. I'm just telling you to watch and pray. 
and ask God to help you make a wise decision as you move forward because it's going to affect your life. It's going to affect your children's lives. It's going to affect your grandchildren. It's going to affect the schools. The money trickles down from the federal government to the state, to the cities, to the counties. To the counties and then the cities. And that's how it flows. If they cut it off here, nothing comes down here. As Christians, we have to be aware of what's going on in society, in America, in politics even. So that we can make changes where we can make changes. Okay. Educated voters. Educated consumers. God chose Moses, who was a man educated in the ways and protocols, protocols of Egypt, as the one to lead the children of Israel out the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses understood the workings of the palace. You see how intricate God is, how strategic he is? He lived in the palace. He knew how to approach the Pharaoh. He didn't just come in there and, you know, be by, he knew the protocols. God knew that this man could, could, could be a part of his strategic plan. And so he strategically positioned him to do that. So as we read about God's appointment of Joshua to leadership of the children of Israel, we see first a message of encouragement. He tells me. He tells Joshua that I'm going to be with you in this. Don't worry about a thing. I'm going to be with you in this. Don't be scared. Because I got your back. Isn't that a comforting thing? As I was with Moses, he said, so will I be with you. He's telling somebody here that right now. As I was with your mother, your father, your grandmother, your, so will I be with you. I'm ordering your steps even right now. Uh... The other thing he tells Joshua to do is obey the law, the law of Moses, the law that was handed down by God to Moses. We might call them the Ten Commandments. They became even uh, more convoluted as over the years. Um, there are about 600 and some odd uh, uh, laws, Jewish laws, that they, they try to follow, but they can't follow them all because nobody can. Um, so Joshua followed Moses and was schooled in the law during the 40 years that the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. But God's promise is that he will lead and guide and fulfill through Joshua the promises that were made to Moses. Moses didn't go over into the promised land because he sinned. God told him to do a, a specific thing. He said, speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock and water came up out. But Moses was told by God to speak to the rock and then water would come out. But Moses was upset with the people. Sometimes people will cause us to miss our blessing. Anger. Anger will cause us to miss our blessing. Amen? Amen. So, so Moses missed his blessing because he was angry with somebody else. So he did not lead the children into the promised land, but God was faithful to Moses. Even, even though he sinned, God allowed him to see the promised land. Isn't God good? God is good. Joshua chose to be a servant leader long before his call to leadership. Let me say that again. Joshua chose to be a servant leader long before his call to leadership. Last week at the New Vision of Faith Fellowship Conference, Pastor Jim and I did a presentation on the qualities of a servant leader. And, and I'm just going to briefly, briefly outline some of those things that we pointed out last week to those who attended our workshop. Number one, a servant leader, and, and let me just say this, everyone in here is a leader because all of us can serve. We're all leaders, why? Because all of us can serve. So a servant leader is one who serves God and not people. 
That's number one. A servant leader serves God first and not people because people can make you miss your blessings. Galatians 1 and 10 says, Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Peter and John, after they healed a man, told the officials who were trying to condemn them that we, they would rather serve God than man. And that's where our bottom line needs to be. A servant leader should be other-oriented, others-oriented, other-centeredness. That's a trait that few of us exhibit. We'd rather put ourselves first. But putting others first is a true characteristic of someone with a servant's heart and attitude. A servant is willing to serve everyone. Matthew 10 and 42 says, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Often we serve just to be seen and we want the desire, we want and desire the attention of, of people and, and the gratitude we want, oh, it's so wonderful. But God, you know, sometimes the, the biggest thing we do is just do what we have to do and, and let God watch and see and give us a reward, if not now, then later. And the reward that he has for us is so, so far exceeds anything that we could ever want or desire on this earth. Another thing a servant leader does is that person serves with an uncomplaining spirit. That's a big one. Have you ever done something and you didn't want to do it and you started looking at who's and smiling at it? Complaining the whole way. Complain, complain, complain. One way you can truly tell if you have a servant's attitude is how you respond when treated like a servant. Are you looking for praise or are you content to serve to the glory of God? We need to ask ourselves this question. Serve with your whole heart. Colossians 3 and 22 and verse 23 says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. As working for the Lord, not for men. When we go to work, do we work as for the Lord and not for men? We had somebody say, I work for my baby, not for, for my boss. You work as unto the Lord and not for men. Not for your children, not for, but as unto the Lord. Because the Lord is the one who truly rewards you. Amen. Our service needs to be done with wholeheartedness, not reluctantly or halfway. We need to keep selfishness out of the equation and, and not try to be a self-promoter. We need to be faithful. We sing a song about faithful is our God. Well, God is faithful to us, but are we faithful to Him? That's a question. Are you faithful to God? Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. Sometimes we don't have because God knows that we're not, we're, we're not faithful and we're not honest. With a little bit, be, be faithful over a few things, he says. And God will make you ruler over many things. So, Pastor Jim and I don't worry about the fact that the, all the seats are, are, are not filled. He says, be faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over much. Servant, service should be done with faithfulness. If we agree to help someone or to do something, we need to follow through with it with our whole heart and not reluctantly. In addition, a leader must be hardworking, not a slacker, observant and alert and committed to kingdom building. They should understand that their own talents and abilities are, are accountable, not just to man, but to God. 
God is the one who gives us our talents and our abilities, and we are ultimately responsible to God. Now, in a few weeks, we will celebrate our sixth anniversary as a church. Somebody said, woo woo. Woo woo. We forgot to woo woo when I came up. Woo woo. Can you woo woo woo? Amen. Our theme this year is greater faith, greater works. Say it with me. Greater faith, greater works. Say it again. Greater faith, greater works. Our scriptural reference is from John chapter 14, verse 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus healed the sick, didn't he? He raised the dead, didn't he? He fed 5,000 on one occasion, and he fed 4,000 on another. He was awesome. But Jesus tells us that we will do greater works than these. Because he's going to the Father. Well, how is that possible? We have the Holy Spirit in us. Acts 1 and 8 says, and you shall receive what? Power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. The Bible says in Jerusalem, in Samaria, Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the world. What, how does that translate for today? you got to start at home in the neighborhood. So we are witnesses in Chicago. We are witnesses across the state of Illinois, across the United States, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. Pastor Jim and, and, and Minister Chris have been to Ghana. They've been to Africa ministering and witnessing the word of God. I was able and thankful to go to Haiti this past February, witnessing and, and preaching and teaching the word of God in Haiti to people who don't speak English as their first language, but speak Creole French. My high school French helped a little bit, not a whole lot. So there's, there's a greater work for greater faith to do. Because each of us is being moved up and out of positions to greater things. So as you are sitting there right now, it's only temporary. You get what I'm saying? You feel what I'm saying? You're not supposed to stay where you are. You're supposed to get ready to move up because God is getting ready to move you up and move you out, can it? to greater works. But it's going to take what? Greater faith. Now faith is what? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the second verse says, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Do you want a good report? Not from me, but from him. Because I guarantee you, you're going to meet him one day. You're going to meet him one day. We were at a funeral just a couple of weeks ago of a, of a young a young woman who went all too soon. And in just the other day, Minister Linda's nephew was shot on the streets. Not seriously wounded, but still shot on the streets of Chicago. So we don't know the day nor the hour when our soul will be, will be required of us. So we need to get busy right now. Doing our father's business. We have appointed leaders in ministry within greater faith. They have been appointed specific responsibilities. And I'm just going to call their names right now. Minister, Minister Benita Burns is over Christian education. Minister Cynthia Duncan is over our administration. She takes care of the business of the business of the house. Do you know that's important? Now. To take care of the business of the business of the house. We can't be slackers. Minister Christopher King is over our music department. Minister Janice Washington is over youth and young adult ministry. And supporting her, we have uh, Minister Alvita and Minister Johnny who are, are, are working with her uh, and others. And Minister Arquette Wade is over health and wellness. How many of you know you can't do the work of the ministry if you're sick? You, you, you just, it just can't happen. So we have to learn ways to stay healthy and well. Minister Linda Woods is over evangelism and outreach, and we were supposed to be in the park yesterday, but it rained. Go figure. That's God's business, not ours. Isn't that right? It's got nothing to do with us. We plan, God makes plans. 
makes the real plans. In addition, over the last six years, we've created supporting organizations designed to further the work of kingdom building in unique ways. One is the Greater Faith Educational Foundation, which is an IRS-approved 501c3 organization designed specifically to help support individuals who are seeking to go on to four-year colleges and or seminary. Can the church say amen? amen. And next we have the Greater Faith Community Development Corporation, which is an IRS applied for 501c3 designed to do community service through housing redevelopment and training of individuals in trades. Can the church say amen to that? That's a good thing, isn't it? Amen. So through education, education, and, and, and uh, community re redevelopment, we're going to move out in faith more and more. Finally, uh, we have the Greater Faith Entertainment, which is a for-profit, say for 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 for-profit entity that will take our multimedia activities to new levels under Minister Chris King. Can the church say amen to amen. that? Amen. Have we seen how far these organizations will go? Not yet, no. But we're happy to announce that we are giving out three scholarships this year under the Greater Faith Educational Foundation. The Pastor Anthony and Radcliffe Legacy Scholarship is giving out three scholarships. Now, say amen. amen. That's a good thing. We're helping three students go to school. Not a whole lot of money in the fund yet, yet. Amen. But we know that God will bless. So, God is good. Amen. And I was seeking the Lord for guidance as to how he wanted us to approach the theme. And he just kept saying over and over and over again, greater works, greater works, greater works. I have a feeling that God has greater works in store for us. But it's going to take greater faith to accomplish these greater works. And that, that's just not the leadership that I, I spoke of a few seconds ago. It's all of us. Because some of you have talents and abilities that you really haven't used yet. They're lying fallow. Uh, and and you're, you're letting your lack of education or your fear or family challenges or work or whatever get in the way of things that you could and should be doing to help you grow and to help the ministry grow. But these are all tricks of the enemy coming against you to keep you from growing. God says, however, that if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, what did he say? That you could remove mountains, mountains, the mountains in your life. What is a mountain in your life? Sickness can be a mountain in your life. Time can be a mountain in your life. Worry can be a mountain in depression, a mountain in your life. But you have to have faith to overcome these things. So as we get ready for the work ahead, we should remember that God did not promise Joshua that his task would be easy. So we can't assume that our work will be easy or the road ahead for us is going to be easy. As Moses second in command, Joshua served Faithfully and always, always with a spirit of integrity. Integrity. And he saw God's hand on Moses. And he saw the ups and downs of Moses' life and his career as a leader over the children of Israel. Was Moses a perfect leader? No. I told you he made a big mistake and it kept him out of the promised land. The other thing is that the word of God never says or implies that Joshua coveted Moses' position as a leader. That's a big one too. Joshua understood that God, God, God was the true leader over Israel. God is the true leader over greater faith. This is a theocracy. We run at God's command. We walk by faith and not by what? Sight. We don't see the end. God knows the end, but we trust him to take us there. Amen? In order 
order to obtain the promises that God implied when he told them that they were going into a land of milk and honey, that the Israelites had to fight. Literally, they had to fight to possess the land. When they crossed over, when they crossed over into the promised land, there were people living there. There were people living in that, and they weren't going to give up their territory easily. There were Hittites there, there were Amorites there, and a lot of other ites there. And they had homes there, just like we have homes here. So they weren't going to just move out of the way and let these people come, no matter what their God said. They weren't going to let the children of Israel just take over their territory. But God said, and this was in, in the scripture that you read. Verse 3 says, I will give you every place, every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country." to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. He tells Joshua that no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. What a promise. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will never leave you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And then he says, be strong and be courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give to them. He swore to their ancestors to give to them. God is great and greatly to be praised. There are many things, many things that we want to do to help build humanity and to support the kingdom of God through this ministry. And to whom much is given, much is required. There's a mandate on each and every one of our lives, just as there was with Joshua. So we need to stop saying what we're going to do tomorrow and do it now. Because tomorrow is not promised. If you know that God has called you for greater works. And you know that it will take greater faith to accomplish that. I want you to come to the altar. In fact, all of us should be here because all of us have been called to greater works. And it's 